Oh, this kid, man, how sexy wants to be on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Back there. <laughs> so it's a big blood test for the far ends of the solar system. <laughs> Welcome, my name is Carol Mengiti, and I'm the wife of Ifani Mengiti, who died about three years ago, and who bought the store 15 years ago, and loved it as much as I know many people do. <laughs> so we just want to say we really welcome the poets tonight. We're so fortunate to have two really good poets, and I hope you enjoy it. And there's some people on Zoom, and I want to welcome them as well. Um, Ifani felt this place was a sacred place. And I feel it is too, because it's like one of the only one and then only all poetry bookshops in the nation. So uh, enjoy yourselves. Thank you for coming. Hi and welcome, I'm Daniel Tobin and I have the pleasure of introducing our poets this evening. I'm gonna introduce them both together. James Burns moving and startling poems render the world with an eye that is at once winningly accurate and thrillingly estranging. Here is the opening of recovery. Let me imagine you coming home from the dark between body and mind making evidence of yourself the way a tree waves up from its shadow. Needless to say, the accuracy of the description begins with the forthrightness of the voice and perception, though as Burns' sentence moves through its couplets, it carries us along into liminal space, then into an ever more surprising imaginative territory, and finally to the phrase, the way a tree waves up at its shadow, that strikes me as something like a cross between Craig Rain and a Zen master, though it is all this poet's own. I love that marvelous slight of mind. A poet, editor, and translator, James Byrne, was born in the UK and was awarded the Stein Fellowship at NYU. Currently, he is poet in residence at Clare Hall in Cambridge. And he's also now, I just found out, visiting poet at Cornell. The author of several poetry collections, Byrne is also has also co-translated and co-edited Bones Will Crow, the first anthology of contemporary Burmese poetry to be published in English. He is at present co-editing Atlantic Drift, an anthology of poetry and poetics featuring poets from the US, UK, and Canada. His most recent poetry collections are Places You Leave and A Breaking Glass. And Forrest Gander. In one of his many consummate poems, Stepping Out of the Light, Forrest Gander observes, you can't set aside the jigger of the present from the steady pour of ours, or even differentiate trails of ants scurrying through some massive subterranean network from the shredded remains of a galaxy backlit by star glow. Yet if Gander's poem does not set aside the present from the pour of ours, it wryly, brilliantly, and in a single gesture attracts the present moment back to its galactic sources. Doing so, it underscores the vividness of the moment's particularity against the backdrop of deep time and in the midst of time's unstoppable flow. The ants paradoxically are, if not differentiated, then accentuated by the poet's very denial. Yes, I love that marvelous slight of mind. Born in California's Mojave De Desert, 
Farskander is a poet, novelist, essayist, translator, and editor whose work has been feted with many awards from the Whiting to fellowships from the NEA and Guggenheim Foundations to Gertrude Stein Awards, the Penn Translation Award to the Pulitzer Prize for Be With. Be with. His elegies for his late wife, the poet C.D. Wright. His most recent books of poems are Twice Alive and It Must Be a Misunderstanding, his translations of Coral Bracho. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, I remember reading here, I think it was in 2013, when Ifiani was uh, such a vibrant and wonderfully generous uh, presence in the bookshop. Uh, so it's great to be back, and I'm really pleased that uh, Ndidi is uh, uh, running the shop now. Um, it's my favorite bookshop, not just because they only sell poetry, uh, though that's a big draw, I think. We're so lucky to have this shop here. So great to be back. Thanks to Daniel. That was really beautiful introduction. Really admiring your own poetry. Uh, everyone should find a book of Daniel's too. Uh, and, and also great to read with Forrest again. Are you there in the corner, Forrest? Uh, I'm over here still. Okay. There's a voice. Uh, and hello, every Zoomer out there as well. So I'm going to read... Um, from a couple of books that are out this year. Uh, this book, uh, Places You Leave, came out. Um, and it, uh, it was really, I suppose, a book of questioning travel and place and displacement. And uh, the section I'm going to read from you is where the book opens, which is um, uh, in, set in the largest refugee camp in the world, which is in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. Um, most of you will know that the Rohingya people have been forced to flee Myanmar. Uh, they're from Arakan. And I was very fortunate to work with some Rohingya poets in the refugee camp. And we, we put together an anthology of Rohingya refugee poetry. So um, I'll start there. And then I'll move on to a second book uh, of Breaking Glass, a different kind of book. Um, I also, I suppose I should tell you a couple of things. So I mentioned the Tatnador. The Tatnador are the Burmese military who, in effect, still rule the country. Um, I mentioned the Naf, which is a river, and that is uh, a river between separating Myanmar and Bangladesh. And I also mentioned, um, well, I quote from a few poets that I was in dialogue with in the refugee camp. So I dedicate this poem to them, uh, in particular, Pacifist Farouk and Ro Maruz. Um, kind of collaborative poem in that sense. I think that's all you need to know. Jesu means thank you. Cox's Bazaar. You plant the jackfruit's anonymous, nubbled face and wait in the boiling sand for something to happen. A goat's eye flashes gold. A girl swings on the tube well for a cup of water. You plant peas to grow in the monsoon and you put on your best shirt, yellow for optimism. What is missing about the blank page is denied, decimated, you would like to cohere. Inside an airless, windowless hut, you try to rewrite Wallace Stevens, 10 ways of looking at a passport but I have never seen a passport. Where does it begin? Tooth marks in the line break. You want to put the art back into heart. When your brother ran towards the Tatma door crying, Jesu, Jesu, you turned and ran. Jahash of air, jail, lock and key. But without art, it's just he, meaning brother. Come here, brother, but he isn't listening. Your mother bribes the army guard to write a letter and asks about the non-trial. Will the guard deliver? Hope's lottery. There is no policy on answering letters of the law. The page is a windbreak. To write is to petition. 
The eye severs you in the photograph, so we repose. Someone else must always be next to you. You cannot work alone. Cyclonic clangor of rain, sword water in the naff. The helicopter pumps into Bangladeshi airspace and fires on anyone swimming away. The poem bare as a pulse, a knife, siblings in graves. The poem bare as a knife, a pulse. Your father remains stuck on the border genocide zone. Nobody is reporting from there, so nothing is said. The child draws pictures of a burning house, singing out of history in makeshift schools. You plant and write, plant and write. What else is there to do? Peas on your roof grow beside the ash fire. You knot back the twine and forecast clouds. You write, blot out jail of air, and the words mean the same in the morning. Zizaga, Anra, Filai, Ezeoji. There are places we leave, you say. There are places we never leave. Home is a dream inside a nightmare. The first line of your first poem begins, I am afraid of someone I don't know. Last night, your mother peeled back the tarpaulin and asked, what are you doing, my son? Why can you not sleep, sleep? And you replied, Emily Dickinson, Emily Dickinson. You ignore the honking of the UNHCR truck, check the download speed for a hundred poets in English, to learn poetry, to learn English, reload. Already they are looking to blame the same someone. The Chinese highway needs to be paid, looking at you, between palm branches brittled by soil erosion. Why is it you live in the largest refugee camp in the world and they're calling it a lost treasure, a forgotten national archive? They ask you to plant trees to save the environment. Yes, you think, a few more trees to hide the smell of the latrine. How do you write in, about environment? You try for the present, the sensory, but your ears sting, your eyes hum, and the smell is flesh and smoke. I want to write about family, but I have no family. The idea of the eternal traveler does not hold. To think of poetry as orphic, to unthink memory, to unriver the severed head. As if the world were a wound flapping its bandages, as if the world were a wound, as if so it's from uh, places you leave, there's nine different places, moves on from there and um, ends up with Lorca in Granada. Uh, so moving on from, from places you leave, I'm going to read a, a poem, a, a poem sequence. It's really one long poem in the book. Um, and it was a bit of an ambush to write this. It was, uh, I was going to um, the desert, basically, to try and make a film. And I ended up writing a book of poems. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope the film will still be made. We're, we're working on it. Um, <clears throat> so, so all of you will remember going back to the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so I'm thinking of like March 2020 in England, where um, yeah, something really tragic happened for me. My brother died, and it was totally unexpected. He was 46. And he had uh, he died of a heart attack, but um, he may have had COVID as well. He had a cough when I spoke to him at the end. So so a year later, fast forward to 2021, and I found myself in Santa Monica, um, and and I couldn't really mourn for my brother very easily because he's a Londoner, and uh, you know sort of the Atlantic away from him. Um, so what I did was I went to Death Valley and I tried to bury the, the sound. Well, my brother's first memory is a sound, right, rather than a visual memory. So I wanted to try and bury the sound of breaking glass, as preposterous as that might seem, but that's my brother's first memory in the world. So this is a book um, dedicated to my brother, Robin. And I'll read some sections from it, beginning with some short lyric pieces and then opening out to a couple of 
uh, more expensive farms to close. Right. I don't think there's anything. Anyone been to Death Valley? No, a few of you. I found it extraordinary. Um, the filmmaker Antonini uh, talks about uh, how, how there is a, a lot of silence, obviously, in Death Valley, but these explosions of sound and silence. First thing you remember, kicking in panels of glass as mum and dad warred upstairs. It was the day he tried to strangle me. It was the night she came at me with a carving knife. Brother, how to bury the sound of breaking glass. If I could wash the blood from your feet, the tears that tear. R, R. Robin, R for robbed, R echoes the night's chorus, the in suffix song sheathed, echoing out. Everything caught up with you, the no, the not yet, grief in the absence of concrete nouns, skin, air, brother. Six a.m. slow fire, heat steps along the pinnacles, a glower of sand at Trona, the valley's theater of dust evaporating over panamint springs until wild rose, where the dashboard locks on a hundred degrees, drive into stovepipe dunes with a medicine bag flailing around your throat. What turns itself on the hearing wheel of vastness gone quiet? Stagecoach cactus basket outside the museum, estrangement as reticence, metabolic, not quite. As if I could find you without touch, like an idea out of reach yet reached for, as if being here means the gallant outdoorsman, not your typical tourist overlooker. Audition for the part of grief's chameleon, cut. The light still rises over your shoulder, as if being here meant it were enough to bear this absence without the absence of air. Take off your skin, quartz into silicon, white globes surround the consent of oxygen. Take off your skin, blush of atomical redness, so much molecular pressure to live inside a life. Take off your skin, grief's abacus of rain, death's hand-me-downs, cold certainty of the slab. Take off your skin, vanish in a wreck of flesh into the exploding stillness, this shattering of sound. Under the rheolite dome of Red Hill, drum smoke evaporates, the kindness of a blue sky. Mirage horizon, real as pixels. Past funeral mountain, there is no pass. Flush as laceration, the dead as alive. Um, so I was thinking my brother, uh, you know, a lot whilst I was in Death Valley, but I was also thinking of you know, people who, who passed, friends um, who had lost people during the pandemic, uh, and also people in the public eye um, who are mentioned in this next section uh, who, who died, like, like um, the Wuhan whistleblower. I don't know, I remember that. Um, so, so that comes up in this piece. And I thought I'd use the form of the alphabet. Uh, there's a wonderful um, site. If you've been to Death Valley, you might have been here. It's called Artist's Palette, and it's just this whole panorama of color yeah, through the mountain range. And so, so I set this next section in Artist's Palette. Um, and um, yeah, I'll read it now. I suppose the other thing I should mention is 
after each entry of the alphabet, everyone gets a color from the palette. A for Alison, her brother gone yet conversant after a decade, Amber. B who lost her father, anything but dying or death, it is his passing lime. C who couldn't hold his mother's hand in the ambulance, Umber. D who fit a, hit a 40 miles per hour sign doing 80, Adriatic. E who tried CPR before the second seizure, but why did you have to die, Abalone? F, fractalized by death, who lives again after burying the sun, Firebrick. G, for Gaia, your uncle gone, and your umbilicus in a locked drawer, Tiger. H, in Jeddah, winding up the memory box of loss, Maroon. I, grieving you, all the places we never went and went, but never leave, Violet. J, whose parents died on the same day, apart but knowing, Cornflower. K, your mother and father in Derby by Amritsa, Surrey is never enough, Coffee. L, whose mother's face kaleidoscopes in a bottle of single malt, Lava. M, for mum, the Laguna, of burying your own son, Rose. N, still walking the penumbra streets of Dublin, dust brown. O, for Olga, echoing in hallway mirrors, ivory. P, night shifting the emergency ward, masked to the eyes, canyon. Q, who renamed himself the devil's psychic, who is empty yet purulent, ecru. Ah, for Tony, there's nothing that compares to the death of a sibling, and he knew, purple satin. S, for you, sidewinder, hissing like a mine, sapphire. T, for Toby, carving the wood of his mother's coffin, Chenna. U, in amaranth pink, singing rebel rebel through the kitchen. V, for Li Wenliang, the Wuhan whistleblower. Bone. W, who staked everything on a blast of new cells, dark slate gray. X, for Kezar Wynn, who shielded children from a rain of bullets, Fulvus. Y, the Shoshone, at the hands of the so called pioneer, red okra. Z, your encore, your platinum laughter, steel teal, and a palette of loss. Okay, and, and I'll close just um, just to reiterate, reiterate my thanks to Carol and everyone here. Uh, it's great to be back in the bookshop, and you're in for such a treat to hear Boris Gander, dear friend, and what a poet. Okay, um, maybe all writing is ritual in some way. I know there's been a lot of writing about that. Um, but certainly this, this book was a series of rituals, and I won't tell you the end, whether I was able to bury the sound of breaking glass. You might have to buy the book for that. <laughs> but certainly I tried. Um, yeah, thanks again. I'll close with this short piece. So there's a place in, um, in, in Death Valley called Badwater, um, and I think it's something like 270 feet below sea level. Um, there are a couple of pictures in this book that I took whilst I was out there, just because uh, we're in a fairly small space, you can see where I was. Uh, performing this ritual, um, there's me. I'll show the Zoom people first. <laughs> that is me there. Um, so this is a section I wrote whilst uh, lying down in bad water the name of the place. To think of you at your lowest point, in the lowest point of the Western Hemisphere, bad water, metabolize this, walk through salt, wall blood, sand hour, brother, nobody can harm you anymore. Myosinic insignia, glass inside clavicles of rock, 
Quartz breath of oxygen, agoraphobia, the limping brother, heal with salt, unsuffer a life. No more counting cracks in pavement slabs, goodbye. A sudden release of pressure, the city's gridded constrictions. Be good to yourself and something good will happen, said the celebrant. Cloud shadow unthreads thorn dyke, drifts over mahogany mountain like a form of breath. Release, you, the child, the petrified angel, the adult who always wanted to leave. Leave. Thank you so much. Carol, thanks for coming and introducing again. It's really nice to see you and thanks to NDD too. And um, if Yanni, um, the first time that I came across his, um, his name was when I was in undergraduate school at William and Mary and um, taking a, a poetry course with Peter Clappert and discovering New Directions books for the first time, which became sort of my real education was yeah. just reading those books. Yeah. And um, Ifiani had uh, introduced uh, in my sophomore year at college, uh, a section of African writing into the annual New Directions anthology. And I thank him for that. And then it was so cool to get to meet him coming back here. And I also thank Luisa Solano for doing all she did for this bookstore. Yeah. I'm really happy to read here with James. I'm just gonna read 15 minutes. And um, but James is one of my favorite poets and people and I feel really honored to read with him. And, um, and in the presence of Daniel, thank you so much for the introduction and congratulations on finishing your trilogy. <laughs> um, and then there are three faces in this audience that um, despite the times we live in, um, seem to radiate happiness and just uh, Martha Collins, I don't know, you know, it's not like you haven't had all sorts of grief and awfulness in your life and, um, and Lowry Presley, I, though I don't see you anymore. There you are. Yeah. Just, and Stephanie Burt, you know, also just, it seems to be like happiness radiating. It's what a skill to have in it's, the 21st it's, century. It's an observer effect. It's because we're around you. No, that's <laughs> not it. Yeah. Your presence does help. Hmm. Um, so a um, little 15 minutes of reading. I actually have four books out uh, this year. Um, one's just out from, um, from uh, Copper Canyon, and it's a co-translation of a Japanese Buddhist poet and named Shuri Kido. And I'm not going to read those tonight. Um, but another is from New Directions, and it's a translation also from Carcanet in England, a translation of the great Mexican poet, uh, Coral Bracho. And um, so Coral Bracho's latest book, It Must Be a Misunderstanding, Debe Ser Un Malentendido, focuses on the poet's mother who died of complications of Alzheimer's with non-judgmental affection and compassionate watchfulness. We come to know reading the poems an opinionated demonstrative elderly woman whose resilience in the face of her dehiscent memory um, becomes most clear in her adaptive strategies. The poems involve us in the mind's bafflement and wonder its creative quick change adjustments and the emotional drama that draws us across that widening linguistic gap that reroutes communication mind goes. One of the reasons that her poems, these poems in particular, sp uh, speak so potently to me has to do with the fact of my own mother's recent death from complication of Alzheimer's. A long section of my book, Be With, is concerned with my relationship with my mom, 
during her last years. And now those poems are too painful for me to read, but I find Coral's poems really uplifting, as I suspect you will. So three of her poems. Observaciones. La casa gira y cada cuarto es nuevo. Cuando ella entra, sabe o aparenta saber que esos cuartos son suyos y que es ella el anfitrión que deberá mostrarlos una y otra vez para compartirlos, tocarlos y nuevamente desconocerlos una y otra vez. Mm. Observations. The house revolves and each room is new when she enters. She knows or pretends to know that those rooms are hers or that she's the hostess who must show them again and again so they can be shared, touched and freshly forgotten again and again. Alzheimer's follow up with the doctor. Who is the president of this country? Well, it depends. For some, it's one person. For others, it's someone else. What is this called? I don't know, doctor, because I don't use that. Only you do. How many children do you have? Quite a few. What did you used to do? Now you're going to ask me to draw a clock, right? Did you like to dance? Yes, of course, of course I danced. And did you ever travel? Yes, naturally. Where to? Well, to the same place everyone went. Intuitions. Which thread is the one that tells our story and lends us substance when there's no trajectory by which to make sense of ourselves? Which thread are we sure is vital? The one that maybe ties together the handful of gestures that comprise us. So we feel we still have control. Gestures that we repeat as certainties, that delineate those certainties which once shaped us and which now delimit and nail us to our shadows. Certainties whose meaning and origin we don't know, but which nevertheless enclose and protect us like dive helmets or grills, which still let us look through them into the world, that disquieting, incomprehensible strangeness. And then I'm gonna read three poems from maybe the most unusual book that, um, that I've had the opportunity to, to write. It's a collaboration with a photographer who photographs mostly naked men. Um, and so this is a, a collaboration of, uh, of, of my writing and photographs of naked men in some relationship with a huge black cloth. It's so called- they're, they're, Are they mostly naked or are they naked? No, they are naked. They're okay. absolutely <laughs> naked, yeah. <clears throat> um, and uh, the photographer's name is Jack Shear. He was the artist Ellsworth Kelly's husband. Um, he has a, a, a few other uh, books of photography and um, this is being released next month by, by Copper Canyon. It's called Knot, um, K-N-O-T. Um, and it begins with that quote from Shakespeare. Um, Thou must, well, how does that go? Thou must untie this knot, not I. Thou must untie this, thou must untie this knot, not I. It is too hard a knot for me to untie. I am not ashamed. It is not in shame that I walk toward you with my face and genitals covered. The cloth doesn't shield me so much as it shields you. I am too beautiful, simply too beautiful. The scored striations in my thighs the marvelous balls of my feet, the flutes of my clavicles, how could you begin to see them? You've never come across anything so gracefully sheathed inside itself. I inhabit all my body at once to the fullest extent, every cell brimming. The particles of air I displace 
as I walk toward you, convene in my wake to gossip over the shapeliness they so recently, so they so briefly caressed. Behind me, there is always that whispering. Look, even my shadow tries to resemble me. The throbbing vein in my throat has no likeness. And if my sex didn't remain a secret, there is simply no telling. I cover myself as a mercy, believe me, because you have no idea about this kind of beauty. Behold me and you would know you've lived your life in a closed coffin. Are you ready for that? I take another step towards you and darkness streams over me. Darkness flocks. It gloms to me like a shroud, a bruise, for so many have bruised themselves to me near me. Um, some of these are uh, appearing in the next issue of Conjunctions, including this one, and some in a magazine uh, called Lana Turner. I, I wish I could show you the images. Um, What are you holding so tightly? You can see it's a corpse, but where are you taking it? It goes where I go. Aren't you far ahead of the funeral procession? It's a private affair, meaning it's someone you loved, someone I would have loved to see make better choices. In time, things will get better for you. You don't know that. What's to come? is just the sentence of my duration. You don't think feelings can change? If time were some sort of measurement of change, it stopped for me. Say what you will, don't you have the present and your own choices to make? You think that between the past and the future, there is an interval in which I'm considering your question, but there is no interval. You don't believe in the present? My future is what I carry my corpse into. And the last of these that I'll read is, is this one. And the image is of, um, this is the least naked man in the book. Um, he's, uh, he's completely covered in this huge black cloth and all you see is this part of his hand at the top that's holding the cloth around him. As long as I hold this up, you cannot see me. You don't know who or what I am or why the cloth's weave has no luster, no pilling, no shading. I am almost invisible. And when finally my hand trails the rest of me inside, where only enough room remains, exactly enough room for that single hand, the one still lifted above my head, holding the cloth. The eye, which used to be me, will have disappeared completely. And the material will no doubt tumble to the floor as though there were never anything inside it, nothing filling it out, or just a capricious spirit, or just a fleet intimation of form. What was that anyway? Don't tell me it was a life. Just my wrist, my thumb, my curled fingers, they constitute all that remains. A green glow at the ocean's horizon after the sun has gone down, something like that. Already, not even something really, only a particle of something attached to what merely seemed substantial, but was instead the nothing to which I am subject to which I granted so much scope, it crowded me out and I became my own ghost. But inside the darkness, inside the in. And I'll finish with just uh, two poems from, um, from um, my book, Twice Alive, um, which has a lot to do with, um, lichen biology and the hopefulness of um, two things coming together and creating a, a different thing that, that may, some biologists say, may have a kind of immortality. It's, uh, 
number of biologists, actually in the newspaper today, the New York Times, there's an article about jellyfish that are immortal, that our sense of mortality comes from our own mammalian orientation, and that there are some things that perhaps um, go on living. Um, and that maybe love is one of those things. Uh, this poem, I was working with a, um, with a um, California biologist um, who studies post, uh, post burn areas in the forest. And um, she, she goes into places that have uh, burned uh, and tries to document the quick return of life because the forest service in California is very much in bed with the timber industry. And when a forest burns, the easiest thing they can do is give all of that land to the timber industry, which will come in and clear cut everything, everything around it, and then burn what they can't use in fires that are even hotter than the forest fires and completely kill the mycorrhizal um, uh, substrate so that nothing grows there again. Whereas if we left the forests alone after they burned, life very quickly returns back to them. And in California, one of the first animals that returns to a, a post-burn uh, fire is the black-backed woodpecker. So we were hiking around this burn zone and, and looking for black-backed woodpeckers. Post-fire forest. Shadows of shadows without canopy. Phalanxes of carbonized trunks and snags, their inter, inner momentum shorted out. They surround us in early morning like plutonic pillars, like mute clairvoyance leading a sursum corda, like the excrescence of some long slaughter. All that moves is mist lifting, too indistinct to be called ghostly, from scorched filamental layers of rain moistened earth. What remains of the forest takes place in the exclamatory mode, cindered utterances in a tongue from which everything trivial has been volatilized, everything trivial to fire. In a notch between near hills stubbled with black paroxysm, we spot a familiar sun, liquid glass globed at the blowpipe's tip. If this landscape is dreaming, it must dream itself awake. You have, everyone notes, a rare talent for happiness. I wonder how to value that, walking through wreckage. On the second day, a black-backed woodpecker answers your call, but we search until twilight without finding it. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, and the last poem um, is, is called Immigrant Sea. Um, I'm, um, my, my partner now is an, is an immigrant to this country and thinking a lot about um, human patterns of migration are greater now than they've ever been in the history of our species. Um, and the ocean um, is usually uh, a welcome immigrant on every continent. Immigrant sea. Around, oh, and this is part of a, um, a sequence of poems uh, that's, uh, that's con connected to Sangam poetry, which is a 2000 year old tradition. Um, does anybody know you're nodding? Yeah, yeah. I, actually, we've met before. Yes, yeah. Um, so Sangam, 2,000 years ago in southern India, um, was, there was a flourishing of culture and of literature and a poetry um, called Sangam, which means convergence, that was marked by um, a, a strand called Akam, A-K-A-M, in which um, people considered it not only unethical, but impossible to write about human emotion without referencing the landscape around you, which is so influential on your thinking, your patterns of perception, and your feeling. 
Um, so it's a kind of proto eco poetry. And influenced by that poetry, I wrote Sangam poems set in California. Immigrant C, aroused by her inaccessibility, he aches for more of her life to live inside him, watching the breakers, standing so close he can feel heat coming off her wet scalp. What is his relation to this person before him, so familiar and foreign? The way he searches out her face, he searches out himself. Gusts, thrash crests of swell, spring grasses twirl circles in the sand where they stand without speaking. She wants him to know it's all charged, even grass, positive, pollen, negative. So when grass waves, it sweeps the air for pollen. He feels electricity all around, as though the wild drama of the coming storm were already aware of them, foreigners on this shore. Little sapphire blue flowers speckle the dunes. He wonders if he has let himself flatten out into a depthless sheet like escalator stairs, whether in the end he'll disappear underground without the smallest lurch of resistance. But when her lavish face turns toward him, beaming, the corners of her eyes wind wet, he yields to that excess, he reappears to himself. Thank you, Groyer, for having me. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Let's give the poets another round of Well, uh, pleasure to. Well, I don't know.